Well, I want to thank uh, Morton and Gitta for inviting me here to, uh, to lovely Scotland. Uh, Scotland is where I discovered Border Collies, which I've uh, had for about 30 years. And God love it Scotch, as my cousin says, Glenn Livett. <laughs> and, uh, and a good friend and also a customer, Donald McIntyre, who coined the term APL, a tool of thought, and sadly has passed on. Remember, the, uh, remember when we had the days of uh, 384K machines and DOS? People remember that here? No, 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 I, I'm not talking about the PC. I'm talking about the 360, IBM 360 Model 50 mainframe with 384K of memory, uh, on which IP Sharp Associates and scientific time sharing uh, Scientific Time Sharing Corporation were running 35 or 40 users on a 384K machine. How is that possible? It was, by the way, about the same speed as an IBM PC, um, about a two millisecond machine cycle time. How is that possible? Well, I mean, this is where we started, right? All these uh, punch cards. And, but we got away from paper. Which was really good. I mean, it, well, maybe not. Then we had this shit, right? Uh, 2741s were going at, what were they, 14.9 characters per second, right? 14.9 and a 134.5 baud. How they picked that, I don't know. But uh, now, if you imagine the IBM PC. Let's see, there's a 25 by 80 screen um, and two bytes per character because you had whether it was blinking or underscored or bright, right? So it was two bytes, 2,000 characters, not, not individual pixel addressability. So that's 2,000 times two bytes is, is 4,000 times 50 times a second, the thing updated, right? That comes out to what? Two million characters a second is what your PC was doing. The mainframe, however, was uh, 134.5, 14.9 characters a second. So there's one difference. Of course, your PC was an, what was it, a 16-bit machine with an 8-byte bus? Is that right, the original PC? Where a mainframe was 32 uh, byte machine. There's a, a big difference. Um, the PC had to do everything itself. The mainframe had these channel programs, independent, right? And, the, and the, uh, the mainframe could just throw the data over the transom to the channel program and say, you handle it. Um, the disk drives, oh yes, 2314 disk drives. Let's see, has anybody seen a, a 2314 disk drive? Well, let's see. The disk drive itself is about this size, right? And there are two um, disk packs on top of each other. And then there are four of these things, um, and there's a spare. So there's nine of them, uh, only eight of which are, are being used at one time. And I wrote it down. What was the uh, total capacity of that? Was Something like 300 megabytes. Now, uh, IP Sharp Associates and STSC, we, we charge by three things. How long you were connected to the computer, how much CPU time you used, and the, uh, um, Bob Bernecki told you of the bug there, uh, the resolution, and also how much st storage you used, how much you saved on the disk packs. I want you to do a little computation now. The, the basic retail storage rate at the time was $10 per megabyte per day. Okay, now take your phone and do some divisions <laughs> and, and see what the gross national product of what company, uh, of what country um, you would pay for today. Uh, but, of course, storage was uh, that... Uh, 
that 30, the 2314 um, disk drive, it was called a, a drive complex, held, I think, about 300 megabytes in total and cost a quarter of a million dollars, slightly more than a quarter of a million dollars at retail. So uh, storage, Moore's law in storage, uh, storage has ex actually exceeded Moore's law. Um, computing, uh, computing power has roughly matched Moore's law, but storage, oral density on disk drives and so on has exceeded Moore's law considerably. So we were using, um, I started at Syracuse University, um, oh good grief, uh, using APL 360, um, which I'm trying to get, okay, whatever. Um, started out using APL 360. Uh, oh, that was another thing. What was the workspace size on a PC? You know, 256K at the beginning. What was the workspace size on the 360 mainframe? 86. <laughs> that was very gen That was much later. No, it was 32K outer parameter, meaning that's what the operating system had to deal with. Um, what we saw was about 28K, you know, because there's a symbol table and all that stuff. If you did, if you did, well, I mean, let's, let's just see. I mean, if you did quad WA, uh, oh, yeah, uh, you, you, get, you had to do I-beam 22 to get the workspace size. Um, and, and notice several things about the display. You can, you can see that it's APL 360 here from what? The extra spaces in IO2, there are two spaces uh, between items of a vector in those days. And of course, there were no system functions um, or variables. And the display of, of programs in those days, when you entered a program, it would be uh, entered into the symbol table and it would be canonicalized into tokens. And then when you displayed the program, those tokens went through a translation display routine and be displayed. So there was no visual fidelity with what you originally displayed. And in particular, there were idiosyncrasies like if in a program you entered 0 0.07 and then you displayed the program, it would, I believe, say 0 0.06999999999. Right, and that was just the display routine would say, well, this is the closest floating point number to point zero 0.07. Um, here we're actually seeing that the effect of that, right? Well, quad can't be next to something. That's two different tokens. There's a quad and a WA, and the WA is a valuer. Um, so this was also APL 360. The original was called XM1. And... Uh, that was the release from IBM. And uh, there were some interesting things about my, some of my customers. For instance, one of my customers was UCLA. Um, originally, we started uh, running IBM DOS, IBM DOS 360. That was the operating system that came out from IBM with the 360 series of machines because OS uh, OS 360 wasn't ready in time. Um, so they made uh, DOS to get something out the door so to sustain, to support the machines. The mythical man month um, is uh, from that. Uh, anyway, DOS, we upgrade gradually from DOS 360 to OS MFT, uh, multiple fixed tasks, to OSMVT, multiple variable tasks, and UCLA was the first ones to put scientific time-sharing corporations um, um, system on an MVT system. Now, they had a 36091, which is a really fast machine at the time. It was the fastest or the second fastest of the 360 series, and it had a floating point box that was extraordinary. It was about from here to the wall, and slightly higher, and it was said 
that when two floating point numbers came in on this side, by the time they got over there, they were multiplied. <laughs> it, uh, it was a fantastic machine. Well, another characteristic of the machine was if one this is, did this expression, of course, the result should be 1, right? Which is faster, the inner product or the matrix division of the inverse, matrix inverse, of a matrix? Well, one would expect, would, one would have, of course, expect matrix multiplication to be faster. Let's just try it. Oh, hell, this, this is XM1. XM1 didn't have quad divide. Um, so let's, let's just switch over to uh, where my commercial stuff. Okay, so this, now we're on APL plus. Um, and uh, this is the time sharing system. And uh, you know, the operator, this was very common because uh, one, there were two problems about time sharing. One was line drops, right? And, you know, the line would drop and you'd have to redial the phone and hear and, and tuck it into the acoustic coupler and thunderstorms in Bethesda or disc crashes, things like that. Uh, those. But on the other hand, it was a wonderful time because you know what? I never upgraded an operating system. I never had to, I never had to do a backup. I never had to screw around with hardware at all. We just signed on and computed. And unlike anybody else at the time in the, in the 70s, we computed instantaneously. And we had a beautiful printout on a 2741 as opposed to this chunka, 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 TTY30 terminal going at 10 characters a second. Gee, we were al almost 50%. And they were noisy and smelly, and you know, they just looked like old teletype terminals that are ready to print out telegrams, something like that. And that's what people using BASIC and COBOL and everything else, I mean, that they, and it was, we just had really, a really tasteful uh, way of computing and displaying the results. Well, one of the problems was we only had a, um, 28K workspace at the beginning. And this is close to the maximum size that you could actually do things with. You know, when you, when you compute something like this, you have A and the inverse of A and the result of the matrix division. That's three copies of A. And if you figure this size of that 30 by uh, 30 by 30, 900 by 8, 70, 200. You have three copies, you're at 21,000 bytes right there in that expression, <laughs> right? You only have 28,000 bytes to go, so you couldn't do it with a 40 by 40. Um, so the interesting thing about the 36091 is the A quad divide quad divide A was faster than the A plus dot times A because it had a very early, very small, instruction cache, um, and it also had uh, a pipeline, which none of the other uh, mainframes at the time did. And the inner loop of the quad divide happened to fit in the cache of the 36091. So this was, this was an extraordinary result that, you know, the matrix A divided by the, even in scalar code, even in scalar terms, A divided by the reciprocal of A is faster than A times A. What well, was a characteristic? But it also illustrated another thing. The original APL 360, um, listen, we had a 384K mainframe. That included the operating system. That included the APL interpreter. That included uh, all the workspaces that were in core, all the user workspaces, and the swap space, and everything. 384K was everything, and we managed to support 30 or 40, I thought it was more like 50, but uh, users at one time in 384,000 bytes of memory. Extraordinary. Well, one of the characteristics of APL is it was a ver very teensy, although very capable interpreter, but nothing was optimized. 
it was it it did it did a reduction a plus reduction okay get the next well maybe that's an well okay get the next element is it floating point integer boolean okay get the op code plus okay get the next item is a boolean character integer okay put it in a register do the addition store it in a result okay second item <laughs> right uh, well, as soon as um, the user base began to develop and we, we began to make an adequate, of money, adequate amount of money to start optimizing, we did. And optimizing, uh, well, Bob Bernecke described one of the optimizations, which was this uh, sort of uh, just-in-time compiler. It was slightly mistuned, however. Um, it turns out that uh, Larry had measured things and said, okay, well, we're going to compile uh, anything with, I think, six or more items. And five or less items is going to stay the original. Um, and this was compiling just a primitive. Okay, we have integer floating point. Here's the code for integer floating point. Put it together and run it. That's what it did. It wasn't really a compiler. Um, well, it was slightly mistuned, so it turned out that, uh, that multiplying or adding five items was faster than multiplying or adding six items um, because it was slightly mistuned. And, and the same parameter was used for all 21 scalar dyadic primitives. So, but that was one way. Reduction. Uh, I th was it you, Bob? Or I, I'm not sure who did the reductions. Um, like plus reduction on Boolean sped up three or five hundred times. Enormous, well, enormous well, speed ups. Okay, okay. Um, but this was an interesting. This was an interesting time because IP Sharp Associates, known as IPSA, and Scientific Time Sharing Corporation, still known as Scientific Time Sharing Corporation, even though people would call it STSC. Um, although they were fierce competitors in the marketplace, were fast friends, co-developers, working together uh, uh, technically. So, for instance, the, the biggest two initial uh, 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 features of APL, can anybody know what they are? File system. FF underscore, the file system, called at that point the file subsystem. Um, and Delta FMT. Uh, Delta FMT was designed by Al Rose, who was, uh, let's see, if, can I get back to that picture? Okay, who's in this picture? Who's this guy? Right there, Bob Smith. <laughs> that is Bob Smith. <laughs> this is the management committee people. This is the management committee of uh, of Scientific Time Sharing Corporation. The big guy in the center is Dan Dyer. He was the president. And Bob Smith. And uh, anybody recognize this? Al Rose. Larry Breed. Phil, Phil Abrams. Uh, uh, well, you may not know the rest. Uh, and behind Phil is, is uh, 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 Martin Gardner, not of Scientific American fame. Yeah. Uh, not, not, not Scientific American, but he was, he was a brilliant guy. And, uh, and, and Dan is in the center. Ed Garner, uh, he was uh, a VP of Marketing in Philadelphia. And uh, Bob Fick, VP of Finance. Is that Kevin Weaver with the K? Hmm? Is that Kevin Weaver with the K? Oh, oh, no, that's me. That's Bob Smith and me <laughs> holding the cake. And this is either the management committee people or the male chauvinist pigs, depending on... <laughs> <coughs> and I don't know what the occasion was for the cake. But I have to say one thing about Dan Dyer and Ian Sharp. These were very, very ethical businessmen. I mean, I, one sees what goes on in business today, and I'm, it's, it's pretty bad. But these men were truly ethical. Um, they did things for their employees. Their goal was not to enrich themselves. It's to enrich everybody, um, including with APL, the world. And it did enrich the world, of course, we know that. Um, let's see. 
as I said, it was really the, re you know, by the way, it, this thing has paused the music. Yeah, okay. I'll let you do that. Um, so it was really the golden age of APL. First of all, we didn't have to do this, right? We didn't have operating system things. It just did what we needed. Um, it was responsive, sub-second response, no backups, no OS upgrades, no hardware changes. Um, hmm? Yes, no spam, that's right. And by the, uh, uh, um, by the way, the original mailbox was not written by Larry Breed, it was written by Carl House of the Rouse Corporation. And Larry Breed took that and made it very secure and also very obscure because Bob and I and others, we worked together, had to maintain the thing into the uh, late 70s. And Charles, uh, Charles also had the, uh, dr had the dredge of supporting it, right, at one point. We, we worked together, uh, uh, Martin Gardner and, and Charles and Bob and Murray Spencer, I don't know if anybody remembers him. He was the guy who designed the chip for the character generator chip for the original STSC APL plus PC. And you had to put a chip uh, on the board. Uh, we all worked together. It was uh, quite a, uh, very much, although we were working at the, at the application and tools level, as opposed to in the, at the zoo kind of level. Um, early, however, in the early 70s, um, Bob Smith was a salesman, and I was a salesman, and Murray Spencer was a salesman. Well, none of us were salesmen. What we were really was proselytizers, accolades, uh, acolytes of APL. We, were, we believed in what we were selling, and our enthusiasm was infectious. And that's how I think, and probably IP Sharp did well, because all the people were young, enthusiastic, and by gosh, we had the best thing. There were no spreadsheets. Everything else was compiled. You know, and everything else, here's your program in, AP, in BASIC or COBOL or whatever, here's your program in APL. Um, so we had a fairly easy job of selling it, except the things that go on in large corporations where, no, this is what we're using. No, but this is so much better. But we're using this. <coughs> but if you were using this, you'd save money. But we're using this. I mean, that was the only argument. <laughs> So, I think it was, it was um, the fact that we felt it was very rewarding. Now, uh, Dan decided he wanted to grow the company very fast, so he had a, co a commission scheme that uh, was, you basically uh, got 10% of the revenue in your territory of the month, and you got 100% of the growth from the previous month. Hmm, okay, just, you know. So if your, the revenue in your territory was $5,000 and it grew to $6,000 in a month, you would get 1,000 for the growth plus 10%, 600. Well, rapidly this became absolutely unsupportable. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Kevin Weaver, who was a New York uh, salesperson, at one point made over $10,000 in one month. You know, when he's 28 years old or 26 years old, and Dan rescinded the commission plan in November of, <laughs> of uh, 1972, or no, 71, yeah, in, uh, in arrears. It was sort of the end of toward the end of, of, of November, and you know, people were saying, oh, I should be making 8,500 this month. <laughs> you know, this is 1971. 8,500 to a 24-year-old kid, like whoo! And everybody was just one guy, actually the San Francisco uh, representative, uh, Bob Henslin, bought a boat. 
You know, he was just, he was projecting infinity. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, uh, it, it was rescinded and went to a more modest commission scheme. Remember that? It caused a great deal of a consternation. Um, in 1972, our data centers split um, between IP Sharp uh, and Scientific Time Sharing Corporation. We went our separate ways in the data centers, and uh, we opened our own data center in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, and we had a 36050, and then we upgraded to a 37155. And then we upgraded to the, to the largest general purpose computer in the world, which is the Omdahl V6. Followed subsequently, uh, uh, apparently about a year later, by IP Sharp also upgrading their data center to this very, very fast Omdahl. Um, but then even that ran out of capacity for our base, so we had to split into two machines. And, you know, the idea of splitting the user base, that this is a very complex issue, and of course, we're losing some of the beauties of having everybody in the same machine. Uh, operations, um, the computer, the uh, operations staff and the uh, our equivalent of the zoo put the heads together. We decide we're going to split into two machines, and uh, they were going to be called, and were called, Faith and Charity. Hope was reserved for the future. Um, <laughs> we never got to hope, uh, because then we went to, uh, we decided as workspace sizes were getting, uh, were getting larger, we were, I think, probably all the way up to 80K at the time, um, we decided to go to VM. And this led to very, uh, many technical discussions between IP Sharp, uh, the technical people at uh, IP Sharp and Scientific Time Sharing Corporation of the advantages and disadvantages of swapping and paging. Swapping is you take the whole workspace, throw it out on disk, bring somebody else in, execute them for a tenth of a second, throw them all out. Paging is, a, is an operating system demand-based, well, you know, these 8K pages have been used and these haven't been used and the operating system does it. Well, the thing about, uh, about swapping is, is, you know, you get to a half a megabyte workspace or a megabyte workspace, <coughs> uh, and, you know, if you get to 10 megabytes, it's, it's too heavy. Um, where paging, I mean, uh, with paging, you could do it. So this, on the time-sharing basis, uh, STSC, al although we apparently supported less users, they could have multi megabyte workspaces toward the end um, on time sharing, which was wonderful. Let's see. Um, the original <coughs> STSC and IP Sharp were very cooperative and then moved apart, although technically still talking to each other and very convivial. I uh, moved and moved to uh, Bethesda from Los Angeles, um, and uh, in the late 70s then uh, moved back to Los Angeles with, uh, with Charles and Bob Smith and um, um, Martin Gardner, yeah, back there with a, a mustache, and we had a really wonderful development group producing things like the Dates workspace and the Sorts workspace and maintaining uh, 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 the mailbox and Emma and uh, other things and working together in 19, late 1978 STSE went public, real public company with stock <coughs> that you could buy um, and that was allowed a lot of people to <coughs> reap nice benefits um, and when I say nice benefits these were orders Dan and Pat, who were the founders of the company, reap benefits in the orders of several million dollars. That was it, several million. But other people in the company reap benefits from 100,000 to 500,000. In other words, today you see, 
well, this guy reaped benefit of 100 million, and these other people reap benefits of 50,000. No, 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 this is a, a very democratic, it, uh, it, was, uh, it was good. We also built our own corporate headquarters, a real corporate headquarters, you know, which was, uh, which again was designed with the people in mind where it was a long skinny building, so everybody would have a, have a window, because this is what Dan... Can I just screen so I just keep the, the carry on? Okay. Um, uh, this is what Dan said. No, we have creative people, and we want the, the. Uh you carry on. I'll okay. Um, sure. We have creative people, and we want to uh, want to give them the creative space in which to work. Um, when I was in sales for the first three or four years, I joined STSC in 1971 and was in sales for pure sales for three years. Um, I had a number of interesting customers, including UCLA, and including uh, Donald McIntyre at Pomona College, John Clark, uh, Orange, Orange County College, anybody remember John Clark? Um, and one time I took a tour, I think this will be the last thing, one time I took a tour of the uh, IBM 360-91 at UCLA. It was a gymnasium-sized room. It was filled with, I mean, the, comp the computer was a gigantic computer, this gigantic floating point box. The printers at the time, the printers had motors to open the drawer, uh, to open a cover. I mean, giant printers, uh, banks of disks all over there, um, Calcom plotters, and this is 12.30 at night and everything is humming and moving and the Calcom printers are making a lot of noise. And, and then the Calcom printers, one by one, they went quiet. Hmm. And the tape drives, they stopped too. And the printers, they stopped. What the hell is going on? And we look at the console, which had many, many lights. It was like Piccadilly Circus uh, at New Year's Eve. Somebody, somewhere in the middle of the night, had taken the, on the ARPANET, the precursor to the internet, had taken the entire resources of the IBM System 36091, and it was, whoa, what a thing. And APL was used by all of the students there. No, this wasn't an APLer taking it over. It wasn't somebody doing a matrix inverse of a thousand by thousand. Matrix. It was somebody doing meteorological computations or something like that in uh, Washington or whatever. But these are the kinds of adventures that we would have as young salesmen, um, learning all about all kinds of different things and solving the problems with APL. Um, so it was a wonderful time. Uh, I don't think we'll ever have such a golden age in which we have no competition. We solved all problems. <laughs> there was no, there were no spreadsheets even. There was nothing. You have a problem, we can solve it. <laughs> all right, thanks very much. Any questions? Thank you, Roy. Uh, a time at which people use the um, computer terminals to connect to their computing power, what we would perhaps since learn to call the thinnest of thin clients, where the processing was done on a mainframe, which we perhaps since learned to call a cloud server, yep. um, and where people didn't pay for to buy the software, just paid usage charges. Um, people who use Google Apps or Trello now, does any of this seem familiar? Yes, yes, it's come full circle, right? Actually, time, time, when the IBM PC came around, of course, time sharing kind of died. Um, although IP Sharp went, continued on because strategically they had taken a more application-oriented direction. So they had more applications. Um, S, by this time, named STSC when we went public, was, was more tool-oriented and let the 
application consultants, the salesmen and so on, build the things for the clients. So our business, our time sharing business went down faster than IP Sharps. But on the other hand, we did the uh, APL plus PC, uh, which was superior to Sharps um, PC implementation. So we, STSC, then bought by a, a telephone company, Contel, and then became Manugistics and all that. I'm, I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm, I'm talking about the, the eighth decade of the 20th century, 1971 to 1980. So time sharing still was valued because, but we didn't have the money to have all these supercomputers that Boeing had, Boeing Computer Services, for example. You know, we have a bunch of supercomputers that well, was still viable, the model of you, w companies cannot afford their own mainframe and so on. But then even that went away until the cloud. And now we're back to the time sharing model. So when your main source of revenue is selling CPU cycles on a mainframe for a dollar or two per second or something like that, and some developer comes along and says, I have an idea for really speeding up dyadic iota, how, d how do you decide what to do? This is oh, going to cut no, our revenue in want half. Just, you know, just, I'm a consultant. You want to do the best for the client at all times, and if we can solve more problems for them for less in, in the same time or have their bill go down, this is ultimately good. I mean, we want, I mean, we were constantly looking for speed-ups in the system, whether it's at the application level or at the systems level, um, because you want to make the client happy. I think the idea of speed-ups uh, were actually welcome, and the customers would continue to use more cycles because they had more things they needed to do. So this is not a zero-sum game. Uh, we would win by getting more revenue, and the customers would win by being able to do more. So it worked out very well. Right, thank you very much okay. for that trip. <laughs>